Fiber improves satiety. Um, fiber, can't say enough about it. Really, you can't do um, too much with fiber because it, it is so helpful for reducing so many of the risks that we have for so many of the health issues. It improves satiety. It improves bowel movement. So in medical school, we learned that, you know, a bowel movement every three days is okay. That is not true. We want one to three bowel movements per day for everyone because it is a form of detoxification. Detoxification is really important because we are now having a lot of toxins that are coming at us through water and environment and our food. So we need our detox systems to be open. We need to be functionally, um, our garbage disposals um, are in the shape of sweat. So sweating is a garbage disposal, um, you know, trying to get urine, obviously, through kidney. We need to drink enough water to make light colored urine, maybe a light yellow, depends really eight to 10 glasses, maybe more if you're someone who works out in the sun, maybe some, maybe more if you're someone who sweats a lot, maybe some more if you're a high intense athlete. Water content really is variable, but at minimum eight glasses a day. Um, there's some studies that show half your body weight in pounds is in the ounces that you need for water. Um, the other big place, so we said the sweat, we said kidney, we said bowels, the other big place is your liver. So supporting your liver with nutrients um, is really important. Um, but that is that is also fiber helps with healthy bowel movements, helps us detoxify that way, reduces the risk for heart disease, it decreases cancer risk. It decreases overall inflammation. It actually turns off inflammatory pathways. It improves our glucose control and decreases obesity. Um, the goal that based on the RDA is 35 grams for men and 25 grams for women. That is the basic minimum that people should get. The average American gets between 12 and 15 grams a day, maybe. Um, so we want higher is more. So, uh, 35 grams a day might be where you start, but then you keep growing with it. The concept of fiber is challenging for some because they're not used to eating. They're used to eating maybe a bowl of blueberries a day, which has three or four grams in it. But there is um, that layered approach where you're combining multiple foods in one serving, um, kind of like that uh, kava concept where you start with greens and you add quinoa and you add a grain and you add vegetables and you add beans and you add you know, nuts and seeds on top. And all of a sudden you have, you know, 15, 12 to 15 servings in one bowl, which can maybe get you your whole requirement for that day. But you have to think about fiber. You got to go after it. You got to start looking at labels and looking at charts so that you can get a general idea. This is that important. You want to start. I don't usually ask people to calorie count or look at um, calories in general, but I do want to look at labels for the fiber issue and for the added sugar issue and for the fat issue. But this is a big one that yet less is more. I mean, so more is more. Um, and the biggest issue I hear back from people is I can't tolerate fiber. I can't eat fiber foods. They make me bloat. They make me feel uncomfortable. But that is a function of an unhealthy gut microbiome. So there are subsets of people who can't handle certain things like gluten, nightshades, um, certain types of fiber. And I think this is a function of your gut microbiome or like celiac disease, of course, is gluten issues. Um, don't want to mess with gluten if that's the case. And maybe 10% of people have a gluten sensitivity and some people have issues with certain types of fiber, but it doesn't mean all fiber. So if you can't, if you don't generally like or can't tolerate say broccoli, it doesn't mean you shouldn't eat any cruciferous vegetable. It should also mean you try it different ways. You cook it, you roast it, you try it in different ways. But as your gut microbiome changes, as it starts to change, then you are going to start to be able to tolerate more foods that have fiber in it. So it's really important to know that you the concept would be to keep trying and don't discount an entire group of fruits or vegetables based on one, like one black bean. I can't tolerate kidney beans means I'm not going to ever eat any beans is not a good idea. You want to make sure you're trying things, even in the nightshade family. Some people get arthritic symptoms with nightshades, but if you are intolerant to say peppers, that doesn't mean that you are intolerant to potatoes and tomatoes and, you know, other things in that nightshade family. So you want to really be cognizant of not excluding entire groups because we want to be able to have multiple sources for getting fiber a day. This is a chart that shows about fiber, you know, 35 grams. If you had an avocado and you had blackberries in one day, that's already 19 grams. 
Um, then you, you had a bowl of lentils. That's another 27, you're up 27, 30 grams. You can have a little bit of broccoli. So you can add this up very easily to the minimum requirement. You just have to make an effort to kind of looking at it. Um, so, you know, these charts are helpful uh, because you can get an idea. But the concept is to try to be able to do things in a layered approach you know, more stir fries, maybe smoothies, you can, you can add and, and change things because diversity is very important. So the other way to grow our good microbiome is through probiotics and prebiotics, ideally through foods. Um, these are also remember how important gut microbiome is, how it is, is so important for turning on and off our genes. We want to create a diverse microbiome. So pre probiotic foods are very helpful to grow the, the guys that are the colonies that are in there, you just get more of them. But prebiotic foods are loaded in certain fibers that are non-digestible and they just grow multiple colonies. So I'm trying to switch my patients to more of the prebiotic concept, um, whether it's from foods or we add supplements when we need, but it is a concept of doing more with these type of foods and kind of growing multiple colonies because we know we age better when we have diversity, when we have diverse microbiome. So each food I eat, so raw kale grows one bacteria, cooked kale grows one bacteria, raw onions grow one bacteria, cooked onions grow another bacteria. We want to diversify how we're eating things because the more colonies we have, the more healthier and resilient we are to the insults that follow us. So we will age better with more colonies. And so that concept would be to try to aim for, you know, 30 different at minimum foods, plant-based foods per week. Um, and you can use these type of foods to help you grow better colonies in your gut. So polyphenols are those phytonutrients we talked about that your plants have made because they are trying to withstand the insults of bacteria, viruses, and fungus, and even sun damage. And so they're loaded with antioxidants and anti-inflammatory to help them survive. And when we eat them, we get that benefit for our body. They're cell messengers. They regulate immune cells. They decrease inflammation. And they can actually affect the manifestation of gene expression and pathways. And they reduce chronic illness. So more polyphenols, more colors, eat the rainbow. Um, you don't necessarily have to memorize what foods have it per se, but you should try to grow some of these keystone states, uh, keystone strains. Um, the polyphenols are very, very helpful to work through. Uh, they've been studied in the epigenetic cap capacity. They signal the gut microbiome. They grow acromensia, which is one of the key bacteria that we have found over the last few years to show that it really helps um, create health. We didn't used to have probiotics that had acromensia in it. It's, it's, in, it's in foods but um, foods that have polyphenols in them, but anti-inflammatory and antioxidants. Um, again, so many good things about these polyphenols and they're loaded in certain fruits and vegetables and whole grains and teas and chocolate and red wine and resveratrol, curcumin. Um, a point about red wine, if you're not an a well, red wine drinker, please don't start. Um, it is never meant to be of a health benefit. It's just that if you choose to drink alcohol, then red wine does have some of these polyphenols in it. Um, but obviously try to do it through other things that are um, less toxic to your body. Um, resveratrol and curcumin uh, can be found in foods, but also in um, as supplements, which I do use on occasion with my patients. So the Mediterranean diet, um, olive oil, grapefruit extracts, green tea extracts also have lots of polyphenols in it. Um, and these are some of the studies that were um, cited in this article. If anyone's interested, they have lots of studies that show the amounts of polyphenols that you need and what they saw in the studies. And there are so many of them. I didn't want to go spend time, but if you can, you can look them up. This is a great article on the epigenetics. Um, so other nutrients that are very anti-inflammatory, vitamin D. Vitamin D is a, a very, very big nutrient that I use you know, I measure in everybody that walks in the door. It is an anti-inflammatory. It's great for cardiovascular disease. It's great for hormone balance. It's um, great for immune dysfunction, autoimmune disease, pain. Um, but it is it is found in mushrooms. A lot of times it isn't enough to just get it through foods. 
Um, and we talked a little bit about um, the vitamin D issues last night in our small group discussion. So people can listen to that discussion about, you know, struggling with low vitamin D. There were some good options that were listed in there. But um, vitamin D, you know, get your level measured and try to get your levels between 50 and 80 range. The, the range on the labs go from 30 to 100. But I like to get people on the optimal or high end so that because it has so many positive benefits, um, zinc has also been studied that shows that it has the ability to modulate the immune response. You can get that through seeds and nuts and different fruits and vegetables. Selenium is in Brazil nuts. Um, not a lot. You don't need a lot. You only need a few, like maybe three to five per week in order to get the recommendation for thyroid function. Selenium is really, really important for thyroid function. And our soils are very depleted in selenium. So there's not a lot of sources of selenium. Um, and, and one, the first thing I check for in anyone with thyroid dysfunction is a selenium level. And coenzyme Q10 has also been studied, which is an antioxidant. It's depleted with multiple medications that we use. So there's also this nutritional deficiency or depletion that happens with meds that we use. Um, the most important class of medication is the statins. And I'm not saying statins are bad. I'm just saying that we have to chase some of the nutrient deficiencies that we give when we give some medications based on risk for people. Um, we have to give them CoQ10. Metformin is another big class in the insulin resistance diabetes world that also depletes CoQ10. So nutrients are also depleted just because we take some medications and we have to kind of chase those levels. So phytonutrients, remember there's different colors, there's um, greens and oranges and reds and purples and whites. And so all of them are loaded in different antioxidants, different nutrients. So vitamin C and A, folic acid, these all are very, very, you know, so many nutrients to talk about, not enough time in this talk, but it's kind of like spices, like there's just so much data and so much information to talk about that. I would just want you to just start doing it, start eating it, just know you're doing your body good. And um, a lot of them help us age better. A lot of them help preserve our structural integrity, brain integrity, help our immune system fight off things like diabetes and heart disease. Again, another list of just the, the, the different types of phytonutrients and what they're found in. Um, in this list, I will say that my preference is that everybody really focus on cruciferous vegetables because of the detox potential and the sulforaphane that's in there as well. Because um, cruciferous vegetables, especially for hormones, I do a lot with hormones, perimenopause, menopause in my practice. And one of the key players is, you know, getting enough uh, cruciferous vegetables in to help metabolize your estrogen. A lot of us are walking around estrogen dominant um, and cruciferous vegetables are really loaded with them. And also want to mention sprouts. Sprouts are huge. They're just packed with nutrients and they're so wholesome. They take care of um, any sort of anti-nutrients that people talk about, like with the lectins, um, that you can get a lot of nutrients packed into a little sprout. You can throw sprouts in everything, but specifically broccoli sprouts, are one of the highest antioxidants out there. And so they're really, really helpful for lots of things in our body, specifically hormone problems. So um, just a small list for people to kind of look through, but um, everything on here is, you know, just add it, diversify it. There's nothing, you know, better than the other. Mm -hmm.